some respects, there's more of a consensus in the nation today about nuclear matters than there has been during a lot of the Cold War. I think the elements of consensus are, first of all, that Russia is not our enemy in any sense that we're used to thinking of. Second, that uh, we have to have a new strategy, uh, that the changes that have been made since the Cold War are not adequate, since the end of the Cold War are not adequate. Third, that this new strategy will involve dramatic reductions in uh, nuclear arsenals. There is already substantial recognition that our current nuclear force posture was designed for a world that no longer exists. As we enter the second decade in the post-Cold War period, common sense should require the United States and Russia to make changes in how we operate our forces, to give each president more decision time and to move our fingers farther from the nuclear trigger. The U.S.-Russian relationship is going to be healthy enough to take a good hard look at the arms control agreements we have had in place over the past 30 years to see how they might be improved, streamlined, and modernized. I believe the opportunity is there to produce a streamlined package that includes at least three elements, accelerated deep reductions, enhanced monitoring and transparency, even for problem areas historically, such as sea-launched cruise missiles, and, yes, an adaptation of the ABM Treaty. I think it is made possible by the kind of relationship our two presidents have established in their summit meeting. We will see more of that in one month's time when they meet at the Genoa summit. But before we embark on this effort, uh, we have to know what we, here in the United States, want. Today, the United States and Russia, two former adversaries, continue to maintain enormous nuclear arsenals, with the only plausible targets of such massive destructive power being each other. The President told us many times that Russia was not an enemy. The Secretary of Defense has echoed that, but also said the other day that when he went to sleep at night, he did not worry about a Russian first strike on the American strategic forces, and he doubted whether anyone did. That we lived in a world, both of them have suggested, in which we ought to think of the Russian nuclear force the way we think of the British and the French nuclear force, not as a potential enemy. Now, a nuclear planner confronted with those extraordinary statements and told to take them seriously, would first of all, of course, realize that our current nuclear posture is exactly configured on the assumption that one should go to bed every night worried about a Russian surprise attack. It must be underscored that mutual assured destruction is neither a policy choice, nor a doctrine, nor an attitude, which President Bush called it the other day. <clears throat> it is rather a condition a situation that two nations find themselves in when they have nuclear weapons aimed at one another. The only effective way to alter MAD is to stop targeting one another. The very act of targeting a nation state or a group with nuclear weapons defines it as an enemy. Mutual assured destruction was a system to manage enmity. If you don't want enmity, you cannot regulate your new relationship with mutual assured destruction. There's an inherent contradiction here. We cannot improve U.S.-Russian relations when the first item on every agenda of every meeting with, between these two countries is preserving the ability to destroy, to destroy each other. We're going to have to manage our way out of mutual assured destruction. You're not going to be able to snap your fingers and make it go away tomorrow. You're not, whether you sign a treaty or pass a law or do it by presidential decree, however you're going to do it, you're going to go through a transition period. There's going to be some uncertainty on both sides as you do it. There's going to be pockets of resistance. These are not monolithic societies. You're going to need techniques that have been developed in the world of arms control to do that. We should not be using nuclear threats to deter chemical and biological weapons use because it increases the likelihood that the United States will use nuclear weapons when we otherwise would not want to. That is both the positive side 
That is what increases deterrence. But unless you think it's going to work 100% of the time, that is also the negative side, because it increases the likelihood that the president will actually have to follow through on those threats. First, we should reduce the number of nuclear warheads. Currently, the United States has over 7,000 long-range nuclear warheads, the Russians around 6,000. Russian President Putin has proposed that the U.S. and Russia each go down to 1,500 or fewer strategic warheads. There is little doubt that even at this level of capability, the nuclear forces of the two countries could produce a level of violence beyond human experience. We should go that low and lower. Second, we should take as many nuclear weapons as possible off high alert status. Third and finally, we should accelerate existing programs to prevent the diversion of Russian nuclear weapons, materials, and expertise. These are three steps that I think can and should be taken and would contribute to making this world, as the first President Bush said 10 years ago, a less dangerous place than ever before in the nuclear age. They would also make up for lost time, and I think we have lost time uh, in these past 10 years. We have seen no reaction from the United States to the proposal made by President Putin to reduce the number of warheads to 1,500. We see hope in the willingness of both the United States and Russia to reduce their arsenals, and it is paramount to start consultations immediately on those issues.